Aloha, everyone. My name is Rob Hack. I'm from the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. We are a Hawaii nonprofit, is a um, quasi offshoot of the U.S. Department of Commerce um, here in Honolulu. And it is our task as a uh, district export council to teach our local companies about all kinds of exporting topics. There are now uh, 61 district export councils around the U.S. And just um, two weeks ago, we had our national uh, meeting, uh, annual meeting in uh, Washington, D.C., where all of the district export councils get together. So it was great to be in Washington for that. We met with um, our U.S. representatives there and talked a lot about exporting and how we can um, uh, get their support for our council and for Hawaii's exports. And I can safely say that uh, our congressionals are very interested in exporting and supporting our activities. So that's great. Um, we're able to put on this series of seminars every year and do one-on-one -on -one company mentoring sessions due to a grant we receive every year from DBET, who in turn receives the grant from SBA as part of the State Trade Expansion Program, or STEP. And here in Hawaii, that's rebranded as High Step. But I'd like to uh, extend our warm thanks to DBET. Uh, Jamie Lum is here today to talk a little bit about the program and to SBA uh, for that grant. So with that being said, I'd like to turn the screen over to Jamie Lum for a minute or so, and she'll talk about uh, the High Step program. Jamie, please, I'm gonna share the screen. Great. So the audience is seeing your website. Oh, okay. Okay. Aloha. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, and thank you to uh, HPEC and to Rob for uh, putting this together. Um, I think that it's a great idea, something that uh, this is a topic we haven't had before. And I, and I think that it's really great. Um, how to use the U.S. commercial service that we do talk about it in our um, in High Step because it's one of the things that High Step money can be used for, as well as the American Chambers of Commerce. So I, th I think that it's a topic. So uh, thank you all for joining us. So um, I am Jamie Lum with DBED. Um, I am um, the one who administers our High Step, our Hawaii State Trade Expansion Program. Um, but we do this program in conjunction with so many other uh, partners like HPEC, um, like John Holman at U.S. Commercial Service, um, um, and others like the Small Business Development Center and the, the uh, Veterans uh, Business Opportunity Center and the Women's Business Center and MIG Center um, and Innovate Hawaii, uh, Department of Health, um, Foreign Trade Zone here. So um, just thank you to everyone that, that really is part of our, um, what we call our exporting ecosystem. Um, so, our high step program um, really is uh, um, in three parts, and and um, you'll you see the website up up on your screen, I believe. Um, so the three components are our export readiness. Um, um, the second component we still call Hawaii Pavilions, and I was just telling Rob that we're um, kind of renaming that portion because we're not talking about just um, trade shows anymore under that, but that's um, Part of it. And then the third component is our company assistance. So um, export readiness um, is our um, series of training sessions such as this one um, to help companies um, gain more information about um, exporting in itself, different topics, uh, different issues, as well as um, learning about different markets and what the potential um, uh, is for their particular product or service. Um, so we have uh, normally monthly sessions um, and we work with HPEC with Rob to put these together. Um, and so uh, again, it's to give companies uh, information and companies um, can range from those that are just looking at exporting as a way to grow their business to those who are maybe already exporting and looking to expand. Um, and with this information, we're hoping that they can um, either, some companies may not have an export plan. We want them to, Put one together, or if they already have one, they can um, perhaps tweak it a bit. Um, 
The other portion of the export readiness is our one-on-one -on -one, uh, business advising. Um, I mentioned the partners um, up front. And so when a company registers with High Step, we will um, partner them, um, assign them to one of our partners for at least a one session of, um, of business advising, just to learn a little bit more about your company and where you're at uh, with your export journey, what your goals are. And um, they can help um, point you in different directions, either with activities within High Step or maybe um, other types of activities that they may, may suggest. So that's all part of the export readiness. Um, so the component that we uh, are now calling Hawaii Pavilions, um, I'm calling it now market entry and expansion activities because um, what we're doing in that particular area is uh, we have trade shows that we've selected uh, to uh, organize Hawaii Pavilions where High step funds are used to subsidize majority of the cost for the trade show. And then we recruit companies to uh, pull together, to come together uh, uh, under the umbrella of, of Hawaii uh, to participate in these trade shows. So um, the next big one we have coming up is the uh, Tokyo International Gift Show in September. And that always attracts a lot of companies. And so um, that's just one uh, part of that. Uh, we also have consumer shows. Um, Again, this is a way, it's not a trade show. It, it is actually directly with consumers and it's a way for companies to be able to uh, test their product in the market. Um, one that we've been doing for the last several years is with the Hongkyu department stores in uh, Osaka. Um, and that's coming up in July. And then um, we also have introduced, um, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of companies uh, started to re rely a lot on e-commerce. And so um, we do have a, um, uh, one or two programs that we've been working on in the Japan market, uh, e-commerce commerce platforms that companies can participate in. So that's also part of um, uh, our market entry and expansion um, uh, activity. And then finally, uh, company assistance is um, where companies can apply directly for funds to help support uh, activities within their export plan. Uh, this is a competitive um, because there are limited dollars for that. So um, it's based on a company's export plan. Um, so if they can, a uh, company comes in and can explain you what market they want to go into, um, how they intend to go about it, you know, give us some background, um, some, um, hopefully they've done research on what the potential for their uh, product or services in that, in that market. Um, and then we have an evaluation committee that, that goes through it. And then Funds are awarded, and this is on a reimbursable basis. So actually, companies have to um, spend money first, and then they come back to us to um, get reimbursed for allowable expenses. Um, things like um, airfare, things like trade shows, um, um, even outside of uh, it doesn't have to be a trade show. That's one um, that you know DBED or Department of Ag is is organizing. Um, things like the Gold Key Service, which um, I'm sure uh, John will will cover not just Gold Key, but actually a lot of the other US commercial service um, services, um, other things like if your product needs to um, uh, go through a certification process to in order to be able to be sold in a particular market and it needs to go through testing, you can use funds for that. So really a number of things. Um, the e-commerce area is a big area. If you need to um, uh, translate your website or set up uh, your, your e-commerce for um, international transactions, um, for digital marketing, things like that. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Again, it's open to um, any small business um, that meets um, uh, SBA's requirements of a small business. Um, you have to be in business for at least a year um, and you have to have a product that um, meets uh, the 51% 51, 51 um, US content by SBA standards, but in Hawaii, we are looking, of course, to promote our um, Hawaii products and services. So um, this is our website. Um, the first step, if you've not um, uh, ever been involved in High Step, is to go to the, the registration and to give us some information about your organization. And then um, that's when we'll put you in touch with, with one of the partner organizations. And then we can go from there. Um, registration doesn't cost you any money, and it doesn't obligate you to uh, to uh, to be involved in any of the activities. So, um, and if you have any questions, um, I'm I'm here to the end, or um, you can reach out to me. Um, and so, 
Thank you. I'll turn it back to Rob. Thank you so much, Jean. Great. As Jamie mentioned, this is our first uh, foray into this program of uh, working with the U.S. Commercial Service and working with American Chambers of Commerce. I've had this idea for some years to put this on, uh, but the pandemic kind of put the kibosh on that for the past few years. But now that we're back and open for business and traveling around the world and exporting our Hawaii products, I thought this is a great opportunity to uh, get to know more about the U.S. Commercial Service and uh, American Chambers of Commerce. So with that, I would like to turn the screen over to John Holman. He's director uh, of the Pacific for the um, U.S. Commercial Service, the International Trade Administration. And, um, John, can are you planning to share any uh, anything, your screen? Yeah, I have some slides, Rob. Okay, great. Uh, please proceed, and um, uh, at the end, we'll have a few questions with John, and um, uh, if, John, are you able to stay till the end, or do you need to get off to um, other you know, You know what's best is if people drop questions in the chat um, okay. as I'm speaking, then I can weave them in. Great. All right. Thank you very much, and uh, go ahead, John. Please proceed. Yeah, thank you, Rob, and also thank you, Jamie and Bed. You know, I just want to comment that DBED is doing a really awesome job with the STEP grant. Um, I believe Hawaii receives more money per capita than almost any state in the nation. I had a chance to see a sneak peek of next year's planning uh, for the events that DBED is supporting through the High Step program, and it's awesome. It's it's really dynamic and a lot of options to help Hawaii companies get connected to international markets. So I'm really happy to see that. Also happy to see Brenda Foster with us today. Brenda's amazing, and I'm grateful that she's able to be a part of this program and still engage with us here in Hawaii. And also, I have to note the topic today is commercial service and American Chambers of Commerce. And we might not be here today if it weren't for Amchams overseas. And I'm talking about you, Rob Hack. I met Rob 13 years ago in Singapore. I was doing a temporary assignment at the US Embassy there. And I met a bit a gentleman by the name of Rob Hack, who was a member of the AmCham or American Chamber in Singapore. That's funny. And, I, I forgot about that, but you're exactly right. That's right. So we met, and Rob's like, "Who is this guy? You you live in Hawaii? What's that like?" He started asking all these questions about what it was like to live in Hawaii. And a few years later, he followed me here when I came back. And uh, Rob's That's been here in Hawaii. How long have you been here with us, Rob? Eleven years. 11 years, and, and that's due to this connection with the U.S. Commercial Service and our Amp Jams. And when I get contacted by companies, they're often like, well, how can you help us? And I can share all the ways that we can help, and I'll share that with you all today. But then also, there's the American Chambers, and I always encourage companies to get connected with the Amp Jams. They're a great local network of American and international companies that can help you uh, in any given market. So I'm excited that this is the topic today. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit about the commercial service. As I said, please, if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat and I will weave that into my presentation. Let me pull up some slides here for you all. All right, Rob, let me know when you can see these slides. See it clearly. Great. So a little bit about the commercial service here today. Let's see, there we go. So why should you export? Uh, 95% of the world's consumers are outside the United States. I mean, we, sometimes we think about Hawaii as, as a limited market, but outside the United States, 95% of consumers representing 70% of global purchasing power. So a lot of opportunity. Also opportunities to diversify your revenue streams and customers, different countries around the world or at different places economically, uh, many are growing. And that spells opportunity for Hawaii companies. And then but business facilitation is another way of saying through free trade agreements, through assistance programs like High Step, through trade events all over the world, it's now easier than ever to do business internationally. Some of the benefits of exporting, companies that export are less likely to go out of business. They pay higher wages. They generate additional income for you and your business. And also it's just, 
a, a really great way to diversify not only uh, the economy here in Hawaii, but also uh, your business. And if you're ever looking to sell your business, if, if you have an exit plan possibly down the road to sell your business, companies that have export customers sell for higher valuations. So another benefit to you as a business owner. Uh, one misnomer is that only big multinational corporations are uh, exporters, when in fact, 75% of U.S. exporters are small businesses of less than 20 employees. So that's kind of the typical size of a company here in Hawaii. And so most exporters are already very small business uh, oriented. And many small businesses create new jobs as they're growing and expanding. Uh, they're hiring locally, creating great jobs. And that's why we do what we do, which is help companies to grow. I always get this question, what are Hawaii's top exports? And of course, travel and tourism, it, anytime visitors come here and spend money in the economy, they go on tours or uh, spend money at local stores, that's a form of tourism export. They hire tour operators. We also see major big figures, figures in terms of education and training when international students come to Hawaii, as well as architecture and engineering services. We have some of the top firms in the world that do tourism uh, development and infrastructure. We also have some undersea engineering companies that specialize in underwater cables. So definitely some big numbers there in terms of services. And then it comes to products. Hawaii's top product exports are broodstock shrimp, bottled water, cosmetics products, apparel, coffee, papaya, and seafood, as you see there on the chart. So one thing I noticed during the pandemic is that how intertwined our product exports are to our international tourism markets. So macadamia nuts, for example, those sales figures seem to be linked to our visitor numbers. So when visitor numbers are strong, sales in many of these categories, especially Aloha wear, are strong as well. And when during the pandemic, when we had lower visitor numbers, many companies in these categories were impacted, but we're starting to see that come back now. What are the keys to success in exporting? I've been doing this a long time and I've boiled it down to three keys, three things that you wanna keep in mind as you go forward and growing your business internationally. First is motivation. So I've seen companies that have kind of an average product. Um, it's, there's a lot of competition out there, but they have an average product, but they get out there, they go to trade shows, they come to us, they come attend events like these, they tap into resources like the American Chambers of Commerce overseas, and when they're motivated, they will find opportunities and they will grow their business. There's a direct correlation between output and results. Whereas I've seen some companies, they have a really awesome, unique product, but they just haven't gotten out there. They haven't invested the time and the energy into going to trade shows or meeting new partners, and they've just kind of muddled along um, in terms of their, their growth and their sales. Number two, uh, key to export success is identifying the path of least resistance. So what market can you get into in the least amount of time with the least effort and the lowest cost and then generate the greatest return? And then you can reinvest that revenue stream and experience into new markets. Um, a lot of companies call me and the first markets they want to get into are China because it's so big and they hear about all the opportunities there, or it's oftentimes Japan because we have a lot of links with Japan. And uh, while those can be good markets, they're usually not the path of least resistance for most companies. Uh, you know, China has lots of challenges in terms of doing business there in that market. And Japan is a different business culture and also very high and strict standards. They scrutinize every ingredient when it comes to food products, for example. Whereas markets like Canada, Australia, Singapore, we have free trade agreements with all those countries. Uh, the rule of law is strong. It, you're likely to get paid. Um, we have similar, we have shared language in terms of doing business. And so what is the path of least resistance for your business in terms of going internationally? That's the key question. And then the third key to, to being successful internationally is finding great partners to work with, whether that's an agent representative, whether that's a buyer, whether that is um, a joint venture partner or a licensee, 
A great partner is someone who you can work with smoothly, who will represent your brand in that market, who is going to ensure that you get paid, which is very important when doing business internationally. And if you don't have great partners, you can spend years um, struggling. And sometimes it won't become apparent until you're a few years into that relationship that it's really not working out well for your business. So finding great partners, especially up front, is one of the keys. And that's one of the things that we help companies to do well um, at the U.S. Commercial Service. So another thing to consider is, are you export ready? And what are some of the considerations that you might want to factor in in assessing your export readiness? So first of all, what kind of domestic success have you had? So if you're selling locally in Hawaii or even the mainland, what do people like about your product or service? I guarantee you, if you're selling product or service already, that there are attributes that people in other international markets will appreciate and will be interested in, in terms of buying your product. Now, uh, what kind of production capacity do you have? So if we find you a new partner in Korea and your sales increase by 20% over the next four months, can you meet that increased demand? A lot of small businesses can't. So planning ahead to be able to scale up when you get those orders. The worst thing is to find a new partner, they place an order and you say, oops, I can't meet that demand. And we see that sometimes, especially in the agriculture space, when companies are growing a product like coffee and they can only produce so much and it's seasonal, and if they get an order for a container of coffee and they can't meet that order, well, they've just lost that sale. So what is your current production capacity and what's your ability to scale up? Related to that is financial resources. So what are the financial resources you need in order to grow the business? And, and, and if you don't know what those are, that's something we can help you with. We can help point you to some of those financial resources. Another idea is to look at where are hits coming from on your website, particularly internationally. That can give you a clue as to where there may be some opportunities for your business internationally. And then where are your competitors selling? So if you have other companies in your category, where are they selling? That can give you an indication as to where there may opportunity. Sometimes that may also indicate that there's a saturation in the market, but that can be helpful to look at. And then what's your know-how in terms of doing business internationally, in terms of shipping, logistics, legal contracts, methods of payment? Now, no one knows the answers to all these things, so, so you can relax, but um, it's helpful to know what you don't know. And you can tap into resources like the Hawaii Pacific Export Council and training programs like this. We have a whole library on YouTube on topics such as shipping and logistics and legal contracts and how to get paid. You can also contact my office and we can help you to get those questions answered. And if it's specific to a market, I can reach out to my colleagues in that country and help, and then they can provide some guidance from on the ground. So looking at your market strategy, the purpose of this slide is just to get you thinking about how when you go to do business internationally, you don't have to do things in a new market exactly the same way that you do them in the, in the United States or in Hawaii. So at the top line, if these are all the things that you typically do in your business domestically for your local market, when you're looking to sell internationally, you can mix it up depending on what the needs of that market are. So one great example is Shaka Tea. Shaka Tea is a bottled beverage company and they make tea from mamaki leaves that are grown in Hawaii, particularly the Big Island. And so you'll see these around at 7-Elevens and Foodland, they sell Shaka Tea. But when Shaka Tea wanted to get into the Japan market, they realized that it didn't make sense to ship glass bottles full of water from Hawaii over the ocean to Japan. It's just expensive to ship water and glass bottles and breakage it's, and perishability. It's lots of challenges. So what they did is they found a partner in Japan who they would license the Shaka Tea brand to, and they would share their recipes and they would ship over dried mamaki leaves, which are very light in weight. And then the partner in Japan would take the dried leaves, would do the brewing and bottling in Japan, put the Shaka Tea label on there in Japan, and then sell under the Shaka Tea brand. So a different way of approaching that market, and it allowed them to scale up and, and to enter that market pretty rapidly and successfully. 
So another thing to just keep in mind is something called international commercial terms or INCO terms. And you don't have to memorize this. You don't have to know all of these. But the purpose of this slide is just to let you know that this exists, because when you're communicating with a potential partner overseas, they may say, hey, um, what's your prices for your product FOB? And if you have no idea what they're talking about, it's hard to provide them with a quote. But what this means, and you see in this slide here, is where the expenses of shipping um, and the title transfer from you as the seller to the buyer. So effort, uh, FOB there is freight on board. And you see that's when your goods land on the ship. That's where the title, the insurance, and the expenses would transfer from you as a seller to the buyer. So it's just useful to know that these exist. And you can Google these anytime you get a quote, um, but you may get some requests um, from buyers who, who would like some pricing uh, with some of these international commercial terms. All right, Rob, I'm gonna pause there. I can't see the chat in this moment. Um, do we have any questions in the chat? No, not yet. Okay, and again, I invite anyone who's watching uh, to, to please drop questions in the chat and I can address them as we go. Now I'd like to share a little bit with you about the internet, the U.S. Commercial Service, uh, which is part of the United States Department of Commerce. We have 250 offices in 80 countries around the world, including our office here in Honolulu, Hawaii. And our mission is to help U.S. companies sell their products and services in new markets abroad. And we do that through our international network. Uh, last year, for every dollar in taxpayer funding we received, we turned that into $360 in sales for U.S. companies. So I'd say that's a pretty darn good return on investment. And, you know, most federal government agencies, they're not able to quantify return on investment. So I can't speak to where your tax dollars are going in that sense. But we do quantify this return. And it's something that we're really proud of in terms of how we're able to provide value uh, to the companies that we help that want to go international. So who we work with. So we do have some requirements as a federal agency in terms of who we're able to work with. So it must be a U.S. company. Um, the product or service must have at least 51% U.S. content by volume or value. So if you're importing pianos from China and you want to re-export those, nothing wrong with that, nothing illegal about that. We just can't use our federal tax dollars to promote this, promote those, those pianos in international markets. Now, if you're, let's say a tea company and you have some Hawaii grown tea and you're blending it with some teas that come in from abroad, as long as that meets 51% in terms of value, maybe you have some lilikoi or some mango bits in there that you blend up with the teas and that value exceeds 51%, then we can count that as a US uh, product. And then we're, we also look for companies that are export ready. So they either have an export sale in, in process. So they've been contacted by someone that wants to purchase their products. They're planning to go to a trade show overseas. They've identified their path of least resistance through attending some of these uh, seminars or doing some market research online. And have done some training videos um, such as these, just so they have a better sense of what your commitment level is in terms of going international. I'm going to pause there for a second. I see there is a question. Oh, it was answered. Um, Caesar Ho asks, is there a good partner for Japan, Korea, and Taiwan? Yeah. So, I, so I, I typed the answer there uh, to Caesar already, uh, that it really depends on the product or service. And I just asked him to send us some more details about that. Great, great. And also, I'm going to talk more in a moment about how we find those great partners from the commercial service side. So there are four ways, uh, re ways that we help companies to grow their business internationally. Uh, first is through market research. So if you go to trade.gov, we have hundreds of market research reports on countries around the globe on different sectors and provide intelligence in terms of what are the trends in those markets, uh, what are the major trade shows? What are the common market entry strategies? What are some of the challenges? And you can find that in our market research library on trade.gov. 
We also John, put on I, I'm, John yeah. I'm just going to interrupt real quickly and say that um, there is a tremendous amount of information on trade.gov. Uh, most of our Hawaii companies will be interested in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, but maybe Canada, Mexico, what have you. But there's there's literally hours and hours of detailed information to review uh, in terms of market reports and what have you on those countries alone, just for free on trade.gov. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Robin. There's two main types of reports. One is a country commercial guide, which is everything you need to know about doing business in Japan, in Korea, in Hong Kong. So look for those. And the other type of report is a uh, industry report. So if you're in the cosmetic space, you might look for the cosmetics market in Hong Kong or in Korea. And there are filters on the left-hand side of the website that allow you to kind of narrow down uh, some of those categories. So look for those. We also facilitate trade events and matchmaking at trade events domestically at major trade shows, typically in Las Vegas. Uh, that's where many of the major trade shows are and internationally. So if there's a trade event you're looking at going to, that's a big industry event, uh, you can check our website or check with me and see if that's an event where we do matchmaking. And then helping to find international partners. That's kind of our bread and butter in terms of how we help companies. And one of our core services is called the Gold Key Service. And the first segment of that, we call an initial market check where you contact us, you tell us about your business, uh, what type of partner you're looking for, whether you're looking for a distributor or you're looking for a retail partner, say, I'm looking for the Whole Foods equivalent in Korea, because we sell the Whole Foods here and we, we've had really good experience. You tell us what kind of partner you're looking for. And then I connect with my colleagues uh, in that market, let's say Korea. And then they will um, ask some questions about your business. So they have a better understanding of what your product or service is. And then they will contact companies in that market on your behalf and then assess their level of interest. And because we're the US government, it tends to shake out less legitimate partners on the, on the international side. It gives you immediate credibility in their eyes because the U.S. government is uh, opening this door for you. And then um, if we receive uh, positive feedback in that initial market check, we then can arrange one-to-one -one meetings for you and uh, those companies. And we arrange the venue, the transportation, translator if necessary, and all you need to do is show up and you have pre-screened, pre-qualified partner meetings uh, with people in that market. So that's the initial market check leading to a gold key service, which is the introductions. We also do background checks. So a lot of companies get contacted by people and they say, hey, we want to buy your product or service, uh, send it over. Uh, here's what we want to purchase. But you're not quite sure, is this a legitimate entity? Are they a good person to work with or a good entity? And so we can do a background check. We call it an international company profile uh, for you. And that helps to weed out you know, scams and, and partners that maybe aren't well suited for you. And then consulting and advocacy. So just answering all those questions that you may have about logistics and methods of payment and legal questions, protecting your intellectual property, we can help you to answer those questions as well. Some resources that I recommend you look into, uh, trade.gov, tons of information on that website. As I mentioned, our market research library. Also, we have videos on uh, e-commerce and how to do more cross-border e-commerce through your website logistics, finance, lots of good information there. Hawaii Export Support is our local website. Uh, some information there that's more locally oriented. Uh, the tinyurl.com export videos on YouTube. This is additional seminars. We have a whole library there on various export topics relevant to Hawaii companies. And then there's some free export tutorials on exportu-com. Um, and then our services. So they're a federal agency. We're not allowed to make any money. And, and so many of the things we offer are at no cost. These are your tax dollars at work. Congress requires us to charge a cost recovery fee anytime we're providing a service to an individual company. And so 99.9% .9 of companies in Hawaii fall into that small category if you have less than 500 employees, and I'm sure most of you do. Uh, and so you'll see their goal key service, for example, costs $300 or $950 and an international market check is $350. So it's meant to be affordable for businesses uh, to grow their business as they look to take advantage of some of these services. 
High Step program is awesome. We heard Jamie talk about it. Um, here are kind of the three key pillars of that program. And then business coaching. So I'm a professional certified coach through the International Coaching Federation. And I also coach companies on their business to help them to create more profit in their business. And, and so um, I'm working with one local entrepreneur right now, and they want to take their company from $200,000 in revenue to $700,000 in revenue this year. And we're working on doing that together. So if, if you have questions about that in terms of working on your business, bigger picture, um, beyond just uh, exporting, uh, you can let me know. So those are all the slides I have. It looks like there's a question that popped in. Okay, so Jamie Rojas writes, uh, where do I find the import tariffs for all Asia countries? <laughs> for, it provided the HTS code. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, or that, that's, that's very specific. So great question. And where you should go is go on to trade.gov and there's a section on trade.gov that talks about um, HTS numbers and the Schedule B number, which is the US name for an HTS number. And it'll walk you through the process of um, how to identify the tariffs for each particular market. And there's usually some links that go to, um, I believe it's the census um, search engine that you plug in your HTS numbers, and then that will, um, show you what the taxes and tariffs are for that particular market. And then here's my contact information. Uh, so feel free to contact me if you have any questions or uh, are interested in um, taking advantage of our resources. Any other questions at this time? No questions, but I, uh, let's walk through a typical transaction uh, with with you there's a let's say there's a i'm making this up completely hypothetically there's a small hawaii company that makes um skincare products and they're interested very much in the japanese market they contact you your office um and let's make it clear that you are at this time you're the only person between california and Asia, right? You're the you're well, the well for the U.S. Commercial Service. That's the right. Commercial Service, yeah. yeah, correct. Okay, so they they contact you. You're the window into the global commercial service. Mm -hmm. um, once a company contacts you and asks you, "Hey, John, we're interested in selling our skincare products in the Japanese market," what happens? What's the next step for them? Great what question. So I might ask them a couple questions just about you know. How, why are they interested in that market? What led them to decide that Japan is a good market for them? Um, perhaps they attended a trade show or they were getting inquiries on their website or they have a retail store here in Hawaii and people are interested in, in their product. So just a little background in terms of, you know, why are they interested in that particular market? And then uh, what I'd ask them to do is fill out a form, which is a little more background on their company and their objectives. And then we send that over to my colleagues in Japan uh, that cover the cosmetics. And we say, here's this Hawaii company. Um, they're interested in the Japan market. They'd like to grow their business. Can you take a look and let us know what you're seeing in the market in terms of potential? And so then my colleagues in Japan will come back and they'll share what they're seeing. Sometimes they'll offer to set up a conference call because they want to learn more about the company, um, talk through their strategy a little bit. And, and that's really useful. This is probably one of the most crucial steps because if we don't see potential in the market, uh, maybe the timing isn't right. And during the pandemic, we saw a lot of that, especially in Japan, where buyers were not taking on new product lines. They were waiting until the pandemic was over before they were taking on new products. And so just knowing, okay, now's not the right time is helpful. Or uh, right now the market's really saturated for this type of product. Or in Japan, packaging is very important. And so my colleagues will provide maybe a brief assessment on the company's packaging and say, this is great. And we think it'll do well in this market. Or, you know, we think here's some things that you could do to make your packaging more attractive in Japan. And if we see potential, then we may recommend a service like an initial market check or gold key service. Or if there's a trade show coming up, like, um, like a beauty show or a cosmetics related specific show, 
we may recommend, hey, have you heard about this show? You might consider this show and coming out. Um, if you have a partner in country, then you might wanna invite them to come with you to this show and then they can be your local contact in a market like Japan in particular. Um, that's, that's one way to grow your, your business. And then as issues come up around contracts or um, legal considerations, financial considerations, then we can answer those questions as they come up along the way. Great. My experience is that uh, where the U.S. Uh, has a long relationship, a strong relationship with a country, um, the commercial service will have multiple officers in that embassy and the consulates that have particular industry expertise. Um, you just alluded to it with, for, for example, in Japan, I know that there is a cosmetics person. Um, there are people who have expertise in apparel or expertise in uh, electronics or whatever you could be wanting to um, export. I just think it's it's a, a fantastic service that our companies need to uh, use more of, and you are clearly the window into that around the world. Is that right? If somebody's interested in the U.S. commercial service, they should contact you first. Yeah, absolutely. So I am the point of contact for our global network, and I can connect you. I just connected a company with our office in Saudi Arabia. We just did a gold key in the Philippines. I just had another company of our a client of ours come back from Thailand and Indonesia. So anywhere in the world um, of the 80 countries where we have um, offices. And then there are, there are also in the markets where we don't have an office, uh, like Cambodia, for example, we have a partner post through the State Department. And so we're helping a Hawaii company right now uh, explore the Cambodia market through um, the State Department embassy there. So that's another way that we help companies. But yeah, I am the single point of contact. And just for an example, we had a Hawaii company just come back from the Philippines. They did a gold key service there. And they're in talks in finalizing a major deal with a partner in the Philippines. And they just said, wow, your colleague there, Tess Sula, she's our commercial specialist who handles this industry. She did a great job and really found some good partners for us. So that's that's the kind of value of our network internationally. That's fantastic. All right, thanks very much, John. Um, that was really a great introduction to the U.S. Commercial Service. I think this is a topic we could spend hours and hours on because they're literally, if you can, I don't know if you can see the uh, the screen, John. The if this is where I would send people to to start looking at trade.gov and just get some general information here and then contact John when you're ready to um, reach out to these U.S. commercial service officers around the globe in the particular markets that you're interested in. Fantastic. Okay, great. Thanks you very much, John. With that, I'd like to move over to our next speaker, Brenda Foster, who was uh, formerly the chair of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. And recently, she moved to uh, Houston, Texas, um, for personal reasons, but we still, with the miracle of Zoom, are able to get her here uh, today to talk about the American Chamber of Commerce uh, in foreign markets. And the reason I did that is because Brenda has been involved in American Chambers of Commerce for a long time. She was president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai from 2005 to 2013. And I thought that she would be a great person to introduce our audience to the American Chambers of Commerce. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Brenda Foster uh, from Houston. Thank you, Rob, so very much. And I'd also like to thank HPEC, uh, Jamie and BBED, and John with the uh, U.S. Foreign Commercial Service. Um, you folks do terrific work, and I always love listening to John because I learn something new every time, John, when I listen to the presentation. Uh, it's amazing the work uh, that we all do, and I think what is the strength for Hawaii companies is that the three organizations 
uh, have a terrific working relationship and we can pull different resources uh, from different avenues, I think, to help our businesses export and be successful in markets. Um, today, I really want to give just a general overview of the American Chambers of Commerce, or AmCHAMs, as they're known uh, throughout the world and what we call them abroad. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with all of my colleagues in the Asia-Pacific region over the years, as well as several in the um, European and Middle Eastern markets. And that was due in part that the State Department, and then I'll highlight this for John on the commercial service, that the State Department had a conference under Hillary Clinton a few years ago that brought all the American chambers, presidents uh, together in Washington, DC to see how we could help uh, US companies export, as well as what we could do to have foreign direct investment from those countries uh, into the United States. And it was amazing the synergy we could all get working together. But American Chambers, so I'm gonna generalize here a bit. I'll do some specifics with regard to AmCham Shanghai in uh, China. But generally speaking, the things I'm going to present are true for most of the chambers of commerce around the region. First of all, they are nonprofit, nonpartisan organizations. They're the leading business organizations uh, in their country or locale that promote US best practices. They are committed uh, to the principles of free trade, open markets, uh, private enterprise, and the free flow of information. Their mission is to enable the success of their members and strengthen the commercial relationship between the United States and whatever country or locale or city in which they are located. They do this in a number of ways. Generally, they provide high quality of business resources and support. They engage in policy advocacy with US and whatever foreign governments they're working with. And they also provide opportunities for relationship building, which is extremely important in terms of meeting partners and learning about the environment that you might want to market to. Uh, they accomplish this in a number of ways. Uh, they host over several hundred events a year. These range from speakers programs with senior government officials, academics, uh, journalists, economists, uh, CEOs, we used to run a program of major CEOs, whoever came to Shanghai, we would get them up talking about their industry and about actually best practices. They also hold the special industry forums and the special industry conferences. Uh, and we, they cover everything from, you know, green technology to automobiles, to healthcare, uh, to food safety, you name it, they will have a conference on it with specialties uh, representing uh, not only the best practices and US products, but also uh, representatives from the market that those conferences are in. They establish uh, industry specific committees. And this is actually a core backbone of many of the AmCHAMs because it's in the industry specific committees uh, that you can really get down and discuss the issues and meet other people who are in those uh, areas that you could share um, ideas with, challenges with, and opportunities with. They'll host specific webinars, they'll have roundtables. they'll have workshops, they'll have conferences. You'll learn a lot about what I would call the supply chains, uh, legal and regulatory issues, marketing, HR, which is human resources, e-commerce. Uh, it goes on and on, but they're very creative, very detailed, and very industry specific. AmCHAMs also conduct a lot of education and training programs. This they may be education and training programs on how you might want to enter the market. Uh, it might be on HR issues. It might be also specialized programs for your staff. Um, one of them that was very popular was on legal writing and learning about contracts and uh, how to uh, write a contract. Uh, another one was also on working with government officials and what you might need to know. In speaking of government officials, AmCHAMs around the region also engage in what we call door knocks. 
These are meetings with senior government officials to have candid and frank discussions about any of the issues that might be affecting US business, but also ways to work with that country to help its economy grow. And these door knocks are held not only in country, but there's several of them each year that the AmChems go to Washington DC to talk with our policymakers about the challenges US business faces, uh, what can we do to help the U.S. be more competitive overseas? And primarily just asking what we can do, whether trade disputes or disagreements, and giving an on-the-ground view and perspective of what we think U.S. officials should hear that they may not hear at a policy level otherwise. We also, um, AmChams, participate in trade shows. You've heard a lot this morning about trade shows. Uh, all of the locales that AmChems are loaded, uh, located in have trade shows that those countries are putting on, also uh, international trade shows that take place at major convention centers, and also they meet a lot of U.S. companies who are coming over to participate in those trade shows. They also work on specialized industry field trips uh, to go to individual manufacturing sites uh, that might be taking uh, place or that looking at other their other members uh, companies and seeing how they're growing and expanding in the market. Uh, AmChems by and large publish intelligence, business reports, research, they'll uh, write policy papers, and they'll also in a lot of cases uh, put together a monthly magazine covering the key issues uh, of that country or of doing business in that country. And they have a lot of just excellent interviews and on the ground information. In fact, when I was uh, interviewing with an international search firm uh, for the position of president of AmCham Shanghai, I relied heavily on the data that I received from AmCham uh, that I could look at what they had published, what did they talk about that was happening in their market and also as well as the US Foreign Commercial Service. Now in some areas, and I'll just highlight this just as a side comment, uh, specifically with regard to China, business intelligence report, uh, reports and consulting information has come under uh, scrutiny by the Chinese government. So companies who are doing consulting in these reports are having to be quite careful because the Chinese for some reason feel that this is divulging information and that people are spying on them. Uh, and so it has gotten some people in trouble, but by and large, uh, it is these type of industry reports that are critical for companies if you're wanting to enter a new market. Um, AmChems also provide a marketing platform uh, for members to promote their companies. Uh, you can have banners on websites, you can sponsor events, uh, you can put ads in publications. They also have roundtable discussions where they bring people in and you can talk to your members, uh, kind of like you know networking at a social event or a happy hour uh, where you can promote and do things. Um, AmChem's very big, AmChem's around, around the region are very big on networking and building relationships. Uh, so besides the substantive events, they also host a number of socials and happy hours. And then a lot of times these uh, social events will include other foreign chambers who will be in that area. So for example, it might be the European Union representatives, Australia, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam. And I know at least in China, we would get together two or three times a year with our colleagues. And it was great to understand their challenges were similar to ours of US companies, but it was also a way to network and look at new markets that might not be in China where everybody was looking at or working, but that they might be able to interest other locales, other countries in some of their products and marketing. It was very, very beneficial. Several AmChams also have satellite offices around the country. Uh, so for example, you might have in China alone, you have AmChams in uh, Beijing focused on government relations, Shanghai and uh, Southern China and Guangzhou on the commercial relationships, uh, Hong Kong also on commercial as well as government, but several countries, Vietnam has two AmChams and the rest. And the reason they do this is to be able to better serve their companies who might have major operations in those locales, 
or it may be our entrepreneurs or SMEs who may just be in and out around the region and working there. And we wanna be able to support our members and the companies wherever they might be and wherever they might need support. AmChems also do what we call corporate social responsibility activities. And this is a way for companies to be able to give back to the community. And we really developed this uh, for my years in China. Uh, primarily, we worked in education, uh, medical programs for the underserved, uh, and it was a great way to understand the needs of a community, to help a community, and to work with government officials on something that everybody could get behind and that would not be contentious. This is critically important when we had the big Sichuan earthquakes and when we did several uh, maternal and child health care and welfare programs, also uh, together with uh, migrants. I know my colleagues around the region, uh, especially in Thailand Southeast a and other areas of Southeast Asia, uh, also do a lot of corporate social responsibilities. It builds goodwill. It makes companies a good citizen, and it's extremely valuable in helping a company establish relationships uh, goodwill, and actually, it's an, uh, another way to get uh, your own brand and image out there. AmChems really are, I think, a terrific resource for exporters. Um, and it's because um, whether you have a presence in the country or not, or whether you enter the country doing e-commerce and doing everything digitally, they're still especially very, very important. And the reason, like the U.S. Foreign Commercial Service, is they provide firsthand market research by talking with people who are already on the ground, who have experience in the market. And I want to stress this for what John was saying and talking with his colleagues uh, around the region in the commercial offices there and AmChams. These are individuals who have long histories in the country. They understand the political, social, uh, cultural aspects in addition to the business aspects, and they can help guide new people coming into the market. And they do. There's not a sense of being competitive or if I help you, I'm going to lose sales. There's never any of that. And I never came across any of that in all of my dealings at AmCham, either at the international level or regional, or quite frankly, within my own AmCham itself, all of our members were more than willing to talk to people, to help people and help everyone get started. And again, I wanna say, this is really important that AmChams really can give you that market information that you really can't always just glean from abundant data resources or industry databases or media reports or government trade associations. I don't know about you folks, but after a while, all the numbers start to look at the same and I try to stay focused. What is it I really want to know? And I find it so helpful to sit down and talk to people like the people who are involved with HPEC, uh, like Rob or, or Jamie, who's worked a lot with helping the Hawaii companies export or John or many others. It's nice to just sit and talk with somebody who's been through it, who's worked with it and who's done it. Um, and again, they can help guide you through all the political, legal, cultural, social aspects also that are equally as important if you wanna do business in the country. I checked with most of my, in preparing some remarks for this, I checked with a lot of my colleagues around the region as to what type of membership categories do they have, uh, not only for in-country, if you have a presence in-country, but as I explained to them for non-resident members. Because I think uh, nowadays, and especially I think if the pandemic taught us anything, it's the importance and the growing need for e-commerce, which may not require um, a presence in the country may require good partners in the country with which to deal with. But by and large, most of my colleagues and the chambers around the region all have non-resident categories of membership. And they, are, they range in price from, I think AmCham Shanghai was around $142 a year. So I'm not sure if it was Japan or others or Vietnam that could maybe go up to $300 a year. These are non-resident, but you can say, well, gee, if I'm a non-resident, you know, what can I really get out of it? Well, what you can get out of it is, and most important, you get access to the chamber's networks and their established contacts, and it enables you to build business. 
It also gives you access to log in to their webinars, any of their Zoom meetings, uh, to their conferences. And uh, it gives you content and it gives you access to the trade missions. In other words, it builds the database that you need, you really need to establish the networks to learn about the markets you want to enter. And I, before I close or before I finish some of the remarks, I really want to go back and stress what John was saying. And I know Rob has said many times that uh, before a company wants to export or enter a new, either enter a market for the first time overseas or enter a new market, I think it's really important uh, to consider what is your motivation? John highlighted this, as well as really, why do you want to enter that market? It's important to understand and think about your strategy. And I really think this is important before you think of what your structure should be. We talk about this a lot at HPEC. Uh, and that's why that export plan is very important. And I know HPEC has worked for a number of years. And I think Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, you have some series coming up on really helping companies try to write their export plans so that they can really understand that. I know we have export 101 university programs and the rest, but actually, Listening to all of us talk is a lot different than when we would sit down with companies, learn about a company's business and work through with you free of charge, you know, what you need to do to plan to develop a strategy and develop that export plan. That is critical. Um, everybody will always refer to me as the three Ds because everybody will, every time I talk, what are the most important things you need to know about exporting? And I'm going to tell you it's the three Ds. It's called due diligence, due diligence, due diligence, whether it's, you know, trade.gov, whether it's working, reaching out to AmChams, whatever it is, HPEC, uh, DBEDS programs, any of the resources, it's critically important. <clears throat> and then finally, I think once you de can develop a comprehensive business plan or export plan with financials, and I'm gonna stress with financials that are realistic based on what you consider your market strategy and with the tax structures under which you'll be working, and then you need to take into account how you're gonna repatriate your profits. I think once you have that, and I think it's really important that AmChams, as you work together with them and US Foreign Service, uh, Commercial Service and the others, it'll be a terrific in-country resource for you. Uh, AmChams, and <clears throat> I've done it over the years, excuse me, <clears throat> have worked you know, without people becoming a member, it's just that if you become a non-resident member or member, you gain so much more. Uh, but anyway, thank you for this and good luck. And I'm out there to support you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Brenda, <laughs> that, that was a fantastic uh, overview of AmCham. Um, so I say this as somebody who has been a, well, I've been a member of an AmCham or multiple AmChams uh, almost my entire career. As John Holman mentioned earlier, I met him when I was living in Singapore and I was very active with the AmCham Singapore, but I've been a member of uh, Beijing, Taiwan, Korea, mm -hmm. Japan, uh, Malaysia. Um, it, it just depends on what your business is at, at any given time, but it's just a great resource for uh, networking and getting to meet people and 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 learning how to solve problems in that market one of the things i think hawaii companies could really benefit from amcham membership is um, finding distributors locally in the market or if they expand into that market and finding that first employee like a salesperson yes. or what have you um, uh, and I just brought up, for example, for AmCham Shanghai, if you were a member, here's what you would have access to this directory of other AmCham members. And in the directory, you get telephone numbers and email addresses and the key contacts and what have you. I also like um, uh, more recently the, the China AmChams, um, that's called a greater China region. They have this AmCham Plus, which you can join. Say you join 
um, AmCham Shanghai, for example, for another thousand dollars a year, you can um, plus up to become a member of all of the other AmChams in the region, including Taiwan and Hong Kong, which I think was um, really a fantastic deal. So I also just brought up some of the ones that I've been active in in the past. This is Tokyo, um, which uh, the Tokyo uh, AmCham was, was very, very active. Um, the Osaka one as well, but I was only ever a member of Tokyo and then here's Singapore. But uh, Brenda, let's back up for a second and explain what is, you know, you'll read in the news, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, right? The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is on H Street, in Washington, D.C., like right across from Lafayette Park and the White House, right? The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a very powerful organization. What is the relationship of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to any of these AmChams, like let's say AmCham Shanghai? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Or, or sorry, then then we have the Chamber of Commerce Hawaii. What What is that all about compared to AmCham Shanghai? Uh, let me start with your first question. For the uh, U.S. American Chamber of Commerce in Washington, D.C., uh, Am AmChams abroad do pay dues uh, to the American Chamber of Commerce in D.C. However, all AmChams abroad are independent organizations with their own independent boards, uh, constitutions, and bylaws. But we pay dues to them uh, just to be part of them and help support their mission. And they also help uh, us in the region. A lot of it is with resources, support, government, you know, and conferences. But all AmCham's are independent uh, in and of themselves and standalone operations. But we just, it's like joining a trade organization in a way. We just all join in uh, to support. With regard to the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce, Hawaii, the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce, you know, supports Hawaii businesses and the issues that affect Hawaii business in, you know, here in Hawaii. To the extent I know, I don't know that they do anything abroad or overseas, but, you know, the type of services that they provide throughout all of their programs, you know, would be on a similar level, maybe that we would have abroad. I think abroad, the American chambers are involved in far more uh, wider uh, business issues than perhaps the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce is here. And we don't lobby. Uh, AmChams do not lobby. They do policy papers, they do their door knocks, and they inform, as we say, you know, government officials of the issues to engage in discussions on how we can uh, perhaps solve some of the issues that at hand. Great. Great. Um, May so, I add one other thing that you're pointing sure. out for a lot of the chambers, um, what's, and that we've all been you know, part of over the years. AmCham Shanghai, under my tenure, had started an SME center, and we've, the name has changed now to a trade and investment center. They also help you find partners, work with the work, you know, within the country. And but what's important about that and important about being a member and networking is I will say, and I don't think I'm wrong, by and large, most companies that came in, eat members gave other members leads on who they could hire, who they could work with, and business leads to help each other. And I think that that has that is to me what stood out. Uh, more than ever for my relationship with AmChamps is each other's members are very, very helpful. Yeah, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. I also found that um, AmChamps tended to function much like the U.S. Congress in that <laughs> everything is done in, by committee and the committees are really critical and joining and working on committees was mm -hmm. really important. And um, it, I just brought up, here's the list of AmCham Tokyo committees. So if, if your particular business was in any one of these, uh, getting on one of these committees and working in the committees and volunteering your time and energy uh, will certainly reap uh, benefits for you. Um, oh, we'll absolutely. Talk. And they give you everything, they know everything and anything about that industry. Um, so can you talk again roughly, because I'm sure people are interested in joining an AmCham, but again, from the nuts and bolts of it, if you're in Hawaii and let's say you are wanting to join AmCham Shanghai or AmCham Korea or AmCham Tokyo, how can you really 
participate if you're you know so many hours off uh, how would that work and um, let's say you only go to Japan a couple times a year for TIGs and maybe another mm -hmm. uh, event how, how can you really participate I and I just like your opinion as a as a manager at AmCham uh, I know how I did it as a uh, as a member of AmCham but I'm just curious for your your opinion um, as a man, well, I can say as a manager too, we tried to do our program so that people who were not in China would be able to uh, log in, zoom in, number one. Number two, we tried, we made sure that they got the materials and the content uh, that were from them. Uh, for wanting to join AmCham, you really need to go on to all of the individual AmChams that you might be interested in and look at their membership categories. And like if you're on, AC, is that ACCJ now yeah. uh, uh, for Japan, look at their non-resident members and they will give you a list. Uh, usually the person membership director will give you a list of all the activities you would be able to avail yourselves of. Certainly, if you're in country, you can go to anything and everything. There's, there's no restrictions whatsoever. But I do understand that if it's long distance, you know, do you log in at three in the morning to listen to a program or what do you do? Um, I went back and checked with Amcham Shanghai to answer your question, you know, add to your question. And they started with, you know, reaching out to the networks, reaching out to people uh, who, you know, are in your same industry, asking questions and coming back. They talked about logging into webinars and understanding how uh, the time of the webinars, the time change and the risk. Hawaii actually isn't too bad in terms, because if it's say nine o'clock in the morning, in Shanghai, it's three o'clock in the afternoon the day before uh, in Hawaii. So it depends also on your locale. Um, and uh, you can, if you can, you go to country, you can participate in their trade missions. You can do that. Long distance though, I think a lot of it is availing yourself of all of the e-commerce activities and doing every as much as you can on Zoom and reaching out through emails uh, and talking with people. But I do know as a manager, we tried to take into consideration that and definitely make sure that everybody knew what we were doing and got the materials from the programs and events we were doing. Right. But just to be clear, if you are a member of the Chamber of Commerce Hawaii, it does not mean that you're automatically a, cha a member of AmCham Shanghai, for example. These no, are absolutely completely not. different entities. Even if you're a, a member of AmCham Shanghai, that doesn't mean you're automatically a member of AmCham Beijing, for example. Or in this case, I have Tokyo up right here. This doesn't mean you're an AmCham Kansai Osaka member just because Correct. you're a member here. Uh, but I, I found that um, if, if you're interested in being a member of two or more in-country AmChams, that they usually will find a way to make that happen for you at a reasonable rate. Correct. Um, so I'm looking right now at just for Tokyo, because I know a lot of our Hawaii companies are interested in the Japan market. If you wanted to be a non-resident member of American Chamber of Commerce in Japan, in Tokyo chapter, the annual dues are 30,000 yen, which is to the tune of 250-ish um, dollars right now, with a one-time fee of um, uh, entrance fee of 15,000 yen. And to me, this is worth it just to get access to the directory and people that you can ask questions to and call and email and mm -hmm. what have you. Uh, I think it's really a, a fantastic uh, situation. And most, uh, there's uh, the other chambers like AmCham Shanghai, it's non-resident member is $142 US. Uh, and there is not a one-time entrance fee. Not all non-resident members at the chambers have an entrance fee, a one-time entrance fee. Some right. do, some don't. I, I think it depends on, it de definitely depends on the chamber. And um According to your business, you may be, uh, as I have been and am now, you may be a member of multiple uh, AmChams, uh, including maybe the European Union, if that's where you're doing business, or Germany, a uh, subset of the European Union. Exactly. Mexico, as well, um, 
And what's important and what would be good for members if they could be in the region, each year, the all the Asia Pacific AmCHAMs get together for an annual conference, a two or three day conference. Uh, sometimes it's in Singapore, sometimes Hong Kong, and we've had it in Beijing and Thailand. And those are really beneficial because they handle all sorts of issues. And then you have everybody from around the region there. And I don't know if you attended many of them when you were in Singapore, Rob, around the region, but they're excellent, just yeah. excellent conferences. And you get to meet everybody. And I also stress to those social events, when you talked about the EU, we had several American companies made great uh, strides in China working with the EU Chamber of Commerce and use that as a platform actually to enter the EU with some of the products and things that were being manufactured in China. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you, Brenda. Um, there's one question here. Uh, again, is AmCham Shanghai the one we should be contacting? Well, I, it, it really depends on your business and what you're trying to uh, do. Most of our Hawaii companies are interested in Japan, and most of those uh, companies are interested in, in getting around the Tokyo region. Is that perfect for everybody? No, absolutely not. Um, I've, I've found some of our Hawaii companies are doing quite well in Korea, some in Taiwan, some in Canada, uh, some selling in Brazil. And there are certainly AmChams in uh, Brazil that you could join. So it really depends. Uh, there's not one blank blanket solution uh, that is good for everybody that I can just give you a, a recipe to do this. I think that just getting involved in one of these AmChams as a non-resident member for a year or two would be greatly educational for your company and save you a lot of money. You may say, well, joining AmCham Tokyo, it might cost me I don't know, roughly $400 for the first year. You may say, that's $400 I could spend somewhere else. Well, that's true, but I think just that first year of membership will save you $400 uh, in cost in some other activity because you were able to contact somebody in Japan and learn about a trade show or some issue that, that easily um, saved you $400. I would also say that being a member of AmCham is like many other aspects of life that you will get out of it what you put into it. The AmCham itself is not going to sell your product. The AmCham itself uh, is not going to reach out through the internet and do things for you and make contacts for you that it, it provides you with a platform and then you have to make the most of that platform. Uh, but I found that if you're willing to go through the directory, look for people, contact those people, um, they're extremely willing to help you and give advice and uh, direct you to potential business in that market. Would, would you agree with that? Brenda? I agree 100 percent. I would only start with an AmCham, uh, join an AmCham non-resident as a non-resident in the country I was most interested in exporting to first. Yeah. And then go from there and go from there because you don't know where it'll lead you, but it can open up so many doors. Those networks are invaluable and people are so happy to help and work with everybody. Yeah, I agree. And I, of course, as Brenda said, you could call AmCham Shanghai today and ask a question and the people, the employees, they're extremely helpful and they would try their best to help. But if you call and say, uh, hi, I'm so-and-so from Hawaii, and I'm a, I'm a member of AmCham Shanghai, uh, then they bend over backwards uh, to help you. That's my experience anyway. Yeah. Okay, great. Brenda, thank you. That was really an exceptional overview of working with American Chambers of Commerce overseas. If there are any questions, um, please email them to me and I will get them answered by Brenda. Uh, but thank you again, Brenda, that was fantastic. There's no further questions. So I'm going okay. to close this session and thank you to everybody for joining. Our next session is actually in person on Kauai, confirmed for June 1st. Uh, then we have uh, export finance options on June 22nd at 9 a.m. 
So please register for that. Anyway, thank you again. Thanks to John Holman uh, from the U.S. Commercial Service. Thanks to uh, HPEX Brenda Foster, uh, formerly president of AmCham Shanghai and uh, formerly uh, chair of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. Thanks to uh, Jamie Lum from DBET and all of our attendees. Please look for this uh, webinar to be uploaded in the next few days um, to the YouTube channel archive of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. With that, uh, this is Rob Hack from HPEC signing off. Thank Aloha. you. Have a, have a wonderful day, everyone. Sure. Aloha. Bye. Aloha.